Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event director. Um, Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to welcome Don Lee for a discussion of his book of stories, The Partition, in conversation with Patrick Ryan. This program is brought to you as part of the One Story Summer Conference. So now a little housekeeping before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcription button on the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please do click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. We're entering into a bit of a slow season for events at Community Bookstore, but we do have some really exciting ones planned for you this summer, including virtual events with Mohsin Hamid and Colson Whitehead. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net and sign up for a newsletter to stay up to date. So now, a little about tonight's program and our guests, and we'll get started. As I said earlier, this conversation is brought to you by the One Story Summer Conference, which is hosted annually by One Story Inc., an organization that supports the art form of the short story and the authors who write them through publication, education, community, and mentorship. You can learn more about it at one-story.com. And Don Lee's latest book, The Story Collection, The Partition, was published by Akashic Books in May. He's also the author of the collection Yellow and the novels Country of Origin, Rack and Ruin, The Collective, and Lonesome Lies Before Us. He has received an American Book Award, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, and the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction. He lives near Baltimore with his wife, the writer Jane Delury, and directs the MFA program in creative writing at Temple University in Philadelphia. And Patrick Ryan is the author of the acclaimed short story collection, The Dream Life of Astronauts, as well as the novel in Stories Send Me and three novels for young adults. His work has been included in the Best American Short Stories, Tin House, uh, Crazy Horse, Tales of Two Cities, and Elsewhere. The former associate editor of Granta, he is editor-in-chief of One Story and One Teen Story. For more information, you can visit his website, patrickryanbooks.com. So without any further ado, I will leave it to you, Don, Patrick, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Noah. Thank you, everybody Hello. at Community Bookstore. And um, thank you to everyone for tuning in, uh, including the students uh, from our One Story Summer Writers Conference. For those of you who are tuning in who don't know about One Story, we are a literary magazine that has been around for 20 years. We come out once a month. We publish just one short story at a time. We're subscription only. We're insanely cheap. We are at one, as Noah said, one-story.com, and you can check us out. It's just one short story that arrives physically in your mailbox every month. And we never publish anybody more than once, so we have now published almost 290 different authors. We get about two to 300 stories a week in submissions, about 10,000 a year. Don Lee's reenactments was a story that we published, and it's a story that is part of the petition partition and it was a story that came in and that I read and that I fell in love with and then exactly as I do every time I fall in love with a short story when I'm reading it as an editor I, I immediately got anxious and nervous and grabby and I wanted it and I sent the email and then I could not wait until I found out whether or not one story was going to get to publish it. Um, two of the greatest joys for me about being an editor are accepting work and working with material that is already in really great shape. And it's not because there isn't that much to do with material that's in really great shape, although that's a perk, but it's because you know you're just helping something get that's already great become uh, even greater. And it was a total pleasure to work with Don on reenactments. One of the things that I can tell uh, when I read him is that he is a writer who reads, I've never asked him this, I'm just gonna make this assumption and a claim. He's a writer who reads aloud as he writes. He's a writer who listens to his own sentences as he writes them. And that matters a whole lot. And I just think you can tell as a reader, you can definitely tell as an editor um, when you're reading 
submissions to the magazine and you read a story and you think the writer didn't read this out loud to themselves. I think Don reads out loud to himself a lot and uh, it shows. There's a subtle polish to his prose that is like checking into a five-star hotel. You know you're in capable hands. You know you're not going to encounter any sloppiness. And you know that while you're in that space, you're going to be well taken care of. Uh, I work on both sides of the fence, as Don has as both a writer and an editor. I didn't know while I was working with Don, because I hadn't been paying enough attention, that he had been an editor for 19 years at Plowshares. Um, it's no surprise to me that on a line level and on a craft level, he's just an amazing writer to enjoy and to learn from. He's a writer who is, I suspect, very much driven by character and voice more than he's driven by plot. And maybe he can confirm or deny that. I appreciate that because while plot is crucial and plot is everything and plot rules the day, as a consumer, I do not read with a plot checkbox. I pay attention to characters and what they do and how they react and interact. And Don Lee delivers time and time again. He is an author that I would follow anywhere. The Partition is the short story collection. That's his sixth book. He's got four novels and two collections of short stories. This is what I want to say to everybody who's watching who has not bought this book. Buy this book. <laughs> Buy this book from Community Bookstore or buy this book from your local indie store. You know you're going to buy books this year. You know you're going to give a few books as gifts. Make this one of your books. Buy this book. Give it to people. Pass it on. It's wonderful. So with all of that said, I'm now going to turn it over to Don for a while. And Don, you're going to talk to us a bit about the book before I jump back in. And you're going to read for us a little bit. Okay. Yes. Uh, before Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Patrick. That's a wonderfully flattering uh, introduction. And also thanks to NOAA and Community Bookstore for hosting this event. Um, I'm really pleased to do this in conjunction with the One Story Summit Conference. Um, I, I think that One Story is uh, one of the best literary magazines in the country. And uh, it was an honor to uh, finally appear. And I, I actually don't think I... I submitted or had my agent submit a story there before. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I was, I was writing novels and uh, not stories. And so um, it was great to, to get in there. And, you know, as I, I told you and uh, Hannah and Mary Beth, you know, I got more reactions from uh, that publication than any other publication in our literary journal. Uh, and so I think that that, that is, um, you know, testimony to the influence and uh, relevance of uh, one story. And so, but I'm really happy to do this with you, Patrick, because, you know, you're a fine writer and you're really one of the best uh, editors I've ever worked with. And, oh, uh, thanks. This inspired a story called Confidence, Confidence, and these are the first two pages of the story which ended up to be more about class and infidelity than race. Nothing good can ever come when someone asks you, as Solvay asked me one summer evening. You know, don't you? Know what? No, you don't know, she said, and her face lured through all the pleasures of an inveterate gossip, plea mouths, titillation relish. I was grilling flank steaks. Kate and I were hosting some of her friends for a Labor Day barbecue at a row house in Rogers Forge, a residential neighborhood just north of Baltimore. The party was a valediction to a good summer in which Kate's divorce had become final and we'd become engaged to become engaged. What I didn't know, what Salve now revealed to me, was that Kate was talking to Charlie Rusk again. Charlie Rusk, the founder of a company that produced something called Host Access Software, applications for mainframes and legacy systems that were quickly becoming obsolete dinosaurs. Nonetheless, Charlie Rusk had been able to sell the company not too long ago for a bundle of money, enough to buy a small share of the Baltimore Orioles. He and Kate had had an affair. Somehow her ex-husband never learned about it, though Rusk's wife had. 
She'd made Russ break it off, and Kate had been heartbroken. They hadn't spoke, spoken in three years, or so I'd thought. Kate told you, I asked Solvay. Charlie did. In addition to being ostensibly Kate's best friend, Solvay was also ostensibly Rusk's best friend. Could she have dreamt of being in a more delightful position? He called her, I asked, or the other way around? Neither. Apparently, a week ago, Rusk had ambushed Kate in the parking lot of the new Trader Joe's on Kenilworth Drive as she was opening the trunk of her car. I still love you, he had cried. I still love you. Don't, she had told him, and had jumped in her car and driven away, leaving her groceries behind in a shopping cart. As she was speeding out of the parking lot, he began texting her, and he kept texting her. Will you talk to me? Please talk to me. I still love you. I never stop. And after an hour, Kate had texted him back, you can't do this to me. And then he had texted, Elizabeth left me. This had been news to Solve, a Russ putative best friend, that his wife had left him. I can't believe he didn't tell me, she'd whispered to me beside the grill. I looked across the backyard at Kate. She was sitting in the shade of the patio umbrella, chatting with her friends, not betraying a whiff was amiss. They've been talking on the phone ever since, Solve said. She put her hand on my forearm and bugged her eyes in concern. What are you going to do? And I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was great. <laughs> I, I, It's one of my favorite things to have read a book and then attend a reading or hear the author read something that you've read so i've already heard it in my head and one of the one of the most consistent things i find is that if there's any kind of humor in the story i missed it in my head and then i hear it and then once i hear it it all just sort of falls into place and uh the the way you read just those opening lines of dialogue was was brilliant uh, was great, and it was so much so much better than the way I <laughs> the way I read it to myself. <laughs> but it's a it's a really funny, uh, wincing story, um, that story. So can we talk just a little bit about the structure of of the partition? There are nine stories, and there they are not just laid out. You know, there 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 is a grouping within the nine. So I'm wondering. Uh, if you could just say a few words about that. And then I'm also curious if, if your editor at Akashic had any influence in, in how the book was laid out like that, the order the stories could go in. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, first of all, it's not a linked collection uh, like Yellow was. Yellow, all of the stories took place in a fictional town in California. And, uh, and you had recurring characters and recurring events. And so, uh, now this one, I uh, didn't do that, which of course uh, made it less saleable. Um, and because everybody, <laughs> all editors, publishers, they, they want linked collections, uh, you know, that they can actually call novels uh, if, if they can get away with it. Um, but um, there are, you know, a, a couple of what I sort of think of as internal linkages, which is that um, you know, each uh, locale, each city, appears in at least two stories. And um, also there are other kinds of motifs, uh, you know, mainly um, you know, bars, hotels, and restaurants. Uh, there's a lot of sort of food. And uh, so those are the kind of echoes and adumbrations that I wanted to place in there so that you could you know that that there weren't obvious links that you might sort of feel in a subtle way, and so the way that I, I ordered the stories, um, it ends with a three-story cycle um, about a single character named Alan, and uh, the middle one is reenactments that was uh, in uh, one story, but it covers forty-five years of his his life, and so I knew that that had to go at the end of it, and that was kind of mirroring the novella, uh, Yellow, that I got all those rejections uh, for. Um, and eventually, that story, Yellow, actually ended up in American short fiction. 
uh, because they had no um, um, uh, page limit for submissions. And they said, you know, we publish anything from flash fiction to the novellas. And so I thought, oh, I'll, I'll send there to there. And uh, Was Yellow, was, was that the piece that, that an editor at Norton before you were a Norton author uh, advised you, gave you the harsh advice that sort of shut you down for a few years? Was it, was it that piece? Yeah. That some, that... Uh, you know, I, I, I think I might have told you about that. Uh, no, you but... didn't. I, 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 I've stalked everything that you've <laughs> said to anyone for the past 10 yeah. or 12 years. I, you know, I know what you talked about with Jane last night. Uh, you know, it's like, I, I got it all. Uh, no, you said this to somebody at some point, and 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 I had a similar experience with a book publisher before I ever had a book. You know where there was this uh, intake, like, and you feel like, oh, are you opening your arms to me? But no, that you're not. <laughs> you are, in fact, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I uh, I said this that story, that long story, uh, to this editor who I knew, um, uh, and. Um, and so then she sent me this this letter, and basically said, "Oh, you know, I, I think that this is uh, you haven't found your voice yet, and uh, and so you need to sort of rethink, you know, what you're doing." And uh, and so that was you know really kind of devastating to me. And you know, I mean, like it's funny. Like I I look back at my time when I was editing plowshares. And I think back to you know some of the notes that that I wrote to people, and yeah. uh, and even though I was on the other side of the desk, uh, you know I don't think that I ever realized the impact um, that those kinds of, um, of critical notes should have. And so uh, and I've you know continued to receive some when it's like. Uh, and one of the stories in the partition, in fact, uh, you know, I sent to a, um, um, had my agent send it to uh, a, a literary journal, and the editor sent back this really sort of snarky note. And it was actually vaguely racist as well. And so I don't think that that original book editor, uh, that, that was involved. Uh, but the, the tenor of it was uh, um, very negative. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that probably could have stopped me cold. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the mark of a writer, I mean, you've got to be thick skinned, sure. Uh, but that, you know, you have to persevere and think, okay, uh, you know, I'm getting all of this sort of pushback here, but I believe in what I'm doing and I'm going to continue uh, regardless. Yeah, and it's, it's it, it, I think it clicks right back into these um, rejection notes that you were holding up. And I, and I went, finally went through a box that I had stored at, a, at my mom's place a few Christmases ago. That was really cheery. And I, and I stopped counting at 500 that I had that I had <laughs> held on to, and but I remembered each. I mean, the, like that your anecdote with this with this uh, ha these harsh words from the editor at Norton and the the you know I was I was invited to lunch by an editor from Simon and Schuster who had read a novel that I had sent, who said yeah I'd like to take you to lunch and then he took me to lunch to to explain to me what a track record was and why if I published this book I would never publish again and. And I left, like, you know, I went in dancing, like, right. you know, the, one of the people who dances, and I left, like, Charlie Brown, uh, you know, at the end of that lunch. Uh, but but the, the notes, the rejection notes that have, you know, or anything that's personal, or all those little things along the way that just tell us before, you know, if, while we're still wondering if we should be doing this, that, that tell us we're not just having a pipe dream. We do have something going on here people are paying attention and it matters it matters so much i think it um yeah. to keep us going and ultimately and i think you would agree with this you we're doing it because we enjoy doing it and that has to be what ultimately is propelling us right yeah and we're, we're writing mean, we enjoy writing 
I mean, I, we're not writing for the payoff. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're a literary writer, you know, there's going to be no payoff. I, I, I wrote this article, uh, essay in, uh, for electric literature, and, you know, saying, I mean, this, I don't know. I mean, if I, I total up the advances and royalties I've gotten, yeah, it might be just three cars. Uh, three cars, like three, well, you know, over, over. Hey, I've never owned a car. Years. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, my model, um, you know, I, I wrote in that article um, early on was Richard Yates. And, uh, you know, I, I met him and, uh, like I, I, I went to Boston uh, to go to grad school in, in 84, 1984. Uh, and, um, and the summer before, I was just like reading a ton. There was a, a used uh, bookstore um, close to uh, where I was living. And, and you know, their paperbacks were 25 cents, 30, 50 cents uh, a pop. And so I ran across... Uh, a book by Yates, Eleven Kinds of Loneliness, and I was just attracted. I'd never heard of him. I was just attracted. What a what a title! And, Story uh, collection, right? Yeah, and so then I, I read him, and then you know loved it, and started reading everything I could find of his. And it said in his bio that he lived in Boston. I was in LA at that time, and uh, and I thought, oh no, I would love to see him no matter reading or you know meet him by chance or whatever the second night in boston i see him at a bar restaurant called crossroads and so you know i kind of worked the courage it took me about an hour i probably walked up to him and and uh at the went to his table and i said mr yates i just wanted to tell you that i'm a great admirer of your work i said sit down have a drink and, uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, and, it, and it's the same sort of thing with this editor from Simon Schuster that, you know, eventually he said, yeah, yeah, show me a story of yours. And so then he called me on the phone and he said, uh, how do you know so much? I said, what? And he goes, you're what, 25? How do you know so much about life? And I thought, oh, I'm feeling pretty good here. You know, he liked the story. And so he's talking about it, but then for a few more minutes, but then he says, but the ending, and then he like rips a hole in me for an hour <laughs> about the ending. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, but you know, I, I saw him at that same bar over a couple of years. And, you know, what I knew about him was, um, he just wrote every day. Yeah. Uh, by, by in a, a few years later, um, his books were going out of print. You know, he made he made no money. Nobody really. He was pretty obscure. And yeah. uh, but and a fantastic, fantastic writer. Fantastic just, writer. Yeah. Just and a so, you know, that's author. that's what I kind of learned is that yeah, you don't do it for most likely you are not going to be one of the anointed where you know you make a lot of money, you get a lot of fame. And so, you know, you're going to have to do it for the love of it. And, you know, for me, it's, um, it's sort of a, an intellectual exercise, uh, a thought experiment, where I'm sort of interested in something. And then I think, well, how am I going to make a novel or a story out of this? And so, you know, that's what I enjoy. That is the process of of you know shaping something and have it cohere. And 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 just briefly, because um, I, I want to get to some questions that are coming in too. With with long stories, you mentioned, um, I, I have been in that situation, and I think most everyone has, uh, unless people were just writing Flash, uh, and I, I've never written Flash, but um, I, I just always had to surrender to what the piece wanted to be and if it was going to be a long story if it needed to be a long story it needed to be a long story and like you say when you reach page 50 you, i mean when you reach page 30 you you pretty much hit the the the, the kiss of death in yeah. terms of most lit magazines but i just think they if it's got to be long it's got to be long and the great thing is when you get a collection 
not only does no book editor care how long the stories are like that, but they like long stories in books. They long stories fill out books and, and the partition has some nice meaty long stories. One of my favorite being about the, uh, the translator, um, um, the title of which is- Yeah, the partition. Yeah. The, oh, it is the partition, it's the title yeah. story with um, but Ingrid. Uh, that, that, that's just a wonderful story that is given all the elbow room it needs. And is not a, I don't think it's a paragraph longer than it should be, nor is it, you know, it, 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 I mean, it's just, it, it, mm. you let it, you let it take the form that it did and hats off to you. And when I read collections and I read long stories, I always go back to the front to see, I wonder if anybody, if it, this one got landed. <laughs> Somewhere, you know. Did anyone publish this? This this long story? Yeah, because in my yeah. collection, the longest pieces are the ones I never published anywhere. Yeah, I try. I mean, it, <laughs> I mean uh, when I was at Flash years, you know, I left in two thousand seven, uh, and so uh, that was what about um, nineteen years of my, actually longer because I was, you know, a volunteer reader and then. Like, assistant editor or managing editor. So it was more like 23 years of, of reading manuscripts for plowshares. And uh, and most of it was, you know, the, those paper submissions. And so I, mm -hmm. it was by weight and thickness of the manuscript. And then you go, whoa, how, how long is this? And you go to the last page and see what the, the page number was. And so, yeah. you know, I mean, I think that there's this sort of unspoken kind of rule that you know, the ideal length of stories is supposed to be 18 to 22 pages or something like that. And that's kind of a, a, a rule that's been shaped by first workshops uh, mm. and then by magazine submissions. And so, uh, but, you know, I, I mean, the stories that I love have tended to be the longer stories. Uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, it's beginning with like John Cheever and, uh, and then going to Andre Debuse, uh, the elder, uh, and then Alice Monroe and more recently yeah. Jennifer Egan, um, yeah. that, you know, these tend to be 35, 40, 40 page stories. And so, um, when I started these stories, yeah, of the nine, three of them were kind of older stories that are wrote between novels, and then uh, six of them are uh, have been written since uh, 2018. And, uh, and, you know, I started writing them, and I wasn't really thinking, I mean, yes, I wanted to submit to magazines, but I, I was, like you said, uh, just kind of, you know, um, letting them take its own shape. And I found that maybe it's because I'd been writing novels, that uh, that these stories ended up to be novelistic, uh, and that they were much longer. And so, yeah. Uh, but at, at the end of it, though, I thought, oh, no, one's, no magazine's going to take this forty-seven page story. Uh, but I was lucky to find, you know, some journals uh, like One Story and yeah, and uh, um, VQR, you know, took the title story uh, and uh, Georgia Review. Uh, and so, you know, there, are, there have been some magazines that have accepted that length, but it's hard. It's much harder. There are uh, venues, yeah, but it's worth, I mean, to, to anybody submitting who's listening, uh, who is just getting underway with that sort of thing, I'll just do the research. That's it. I mean, you can find the places. Just don't waste your time sending something. You're not really going to waste anybody's time on the other end because they're going to open the file and see how long it is and then go oh, non-starter uh but but there are places that you know, that are worth looking uh, it's worth doing the research uh, like yeah i mean you know i don't i don't know how you are with submissions but uh when i was at plowshares um i knew it essentially within the first paragraph whether i was going to be interested in the story uh and you know someone could hook me but it was that yeah, you know, but it wasn't sort of a gimmicky, you know, hooky uh, beginning. Uh, it was mostly just the narrative authority. Somebody yeah. just kind of not trying to show off, but you could just sort of tell by the 
by the rhythm of, <clears throat> of the sentences that uh, there was a, a unique voice here. And so that's what would sort of carry me through. I wouldn't make a decision within the first paragraph, uh, but, you know, I could sort of tell, uh, you know, this is, this is the first I impression. Feel like, I can feel like this is going to be good. Uh, yeah. And you know, go in with with uh, you know that sort of excitement and hope. And and I remember the first time I read uh, reenactments, th it was the, the same with any other story that I'm falling in love with. And I'm reading with my editor job hat on. Is I, as I get near, I, I know I'm two or three pages from the end. And I'm two pages from the end, and I start leaning forward, and my muscle. I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm not exaggerating. My muscles start to tighten up. My legs, my, I've realized my knees are just kind of locked and my, my elbows, because I'm thinking, please don't fuck this up, please don't. <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be so great if I, you know, like, because I don't want to love it all and hate the ending and then have to say, well, I mean, I might do that, you know, will you give it a new ending? But I'd rather work with the ending that the author is going for and then to just hit the end. And, and, and we're going to run out of time, but I just want to say you, you end, um, reenactments and you end a couple of other stories in the partition on questions you end them ambiguously and it's it's such an interesting choice and i think that it's great for us writers to to always keep in mind that this is an option when we get to the end of a short story is to look at the way we've decided to end it in draft and think well i wonder if i want to obviously you know we always want to ask ourselves we'll lop off the last paragraph or lop off the last few lines or something but just leaving something vague. And there is uh, reenactments focuses on one line of dialogue that this actor has, the only line in the entire film. And, and it's talked about throughout the story. How are you gonna deliver the line? How are you gonna deliver the line? What are you gonna say? And then the story ends with the needle lifting, so to speak, before we really find out how that moment plays out. So I asked you, you know, how great you ended it ambiguously. Do you know? And you said, yes. And I'm not, I said, do you know what he says, what he ultimately says? And you said, yes. And I'm not telling you basically, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. It, it, it's the ultimate control. No insider, no insider dope. Uh, yeah, you know, we, I mean, I, I think that as a, you know, as a writer and, uh, but, you know, especially as a, as a reader, I love uh, that sort of ambiguity and endings. Uh, what I actually love is when you think uh, you know what's going on at, uh, at the end, but then you sort of uh, ponder it and realize, oh, it actually could go a different way. And yes. uh, you're, you're yeah. held in advance uh, that yeah. way. And so, but you know, as long as it's, um, it's still satisfying, uh, mm -hmm. that it's not something that uh, you feel has been a cheat and mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you're, you've been uh, kind of uh, ripped off in, you know, in, in some way of not giving you an indication. Uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, ambiguous endings, uh, I love that. Boy, when they work, I, I feel so lucky when I get one that, that actually works as a writer. Yeah, and and lucky enough to have realized uh, to take the risk. Okay, so I'm going to jump into a couple of these questions here. Um, forgive me as I lean in closer than anybody would want to be to my giant forehead. Uh, Annie Warner asks, "How did you train your descriptive eye? What's your revision process like?" I want to get through all of the questions if we can. So if you can, you know, just try to uh, be succinct. I know that's a challenge, um, yeah. but. How do you train your description? I mean, you know what? I, actually, yeah, I think that that's my weakness as a, as a writer. Um, I don't have, I am not good at in particular uh, natural uh, descriptions or descriptions of nature, descriptions of, you know, what's going on. And, and so the way I compensate is uh, through, um, detail that I've gotten from research about some occupation or what, whatever, but I'm actually not good uh, at um, describing, uh, let's say, um, 
a setting or um, the atmosphere. And, uh, and that's something that I really admire um, in other writers. And I think that actually has to do with, you know, a certain kind of, of you know, lyrical observation. Uh, that poets have and so that's actually uh, something I would love to be get, love to get better at well that's a very honest answer you're very good at it already but yeah <laughs> I, I, I totally agree um, one anonymous attendee says uh, this person cannot wait to read your books the question is do you have to work to strike a balance between the writing and the business side of things. And it was something I was curious about too, because you've been a full-time editor while you were writing and, and you've been a full, and you are now a full-time writing teacher while you're writing. Um, how do you, how do you find the balance for that? Yeah, well, those are two different things about, you know, writing with, with a job, a day job, uh, and then the business side of, uh, of publishing and so you know first I'll go into the day job which is um, you know it is uh, I probably had an easier I, I left class shares because I thought oh you know I think if I uh, am teaching uh, and become a professor I'll have more time to write uh, but I actually ended up that it was harder for me uh, to write when I got into full-time teaching it was mostly because um, I suddenly had to become a binge writer where I would just, you know, the summer would come, the semester would end, the summer would come, and I'd have to, like, turn on the jets and get as much work uh, done as possible in, you know, three and a half months. Um, when I was at Plowshares, what I did was I negotiated to get Fridays off. And so I, you know, I was, oh, yeah, I was a nine to five. And, uh, and then I wrote on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I figured out, okay, if I write two pages a day, three days a week, uh, I'm gonna have the first draft of a novel in a year. And, uh, and so that's what I started doing. And what about those days when you only write a paragraph? <laughs> well, I, uh, I, would, I would force myself to write, you know, two pages, two double space pages a day. And, uh, you know, but the promise I may, had to make, I mean, the big change was right from writing stories to writing novels is I had to be able to live with my bad writing. You know, with the stories, I would sort of eke out a line. If I wasn't happy about it, I'd revise it and keep, you know, revising until I went on. But you can't do that with novels. You know, you've got to be able to, you can't see the whole picture yet. Um, yeah. And so, you know, you've got to lay it down and then figure out what you have and then you can revise it. And so you got to, you know, and uh, the other thing, too, is that, you know, the entire time you're thinking this is going to fall apart. This novel is going to fall apart. And, uh, and until you actually finish the first draft, um, you have absolutely no confidence in it. And so, you know, and then it's actually such a relief. You can make major revisions in your ensuing drafts, but that doesn't bother you because you, you know that you actually have something that works. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's what happened was that I actually wrote by, the first novel I wrote by hand, and then I would turn the pages over. I'd look at them the next day, kind of scribble some stuff, but I'd turn them over, and I didn't look at them again until I finished that first draft uh, for, the, for the, the first novel. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, that kind of steadiness allowed me, you know, even with a essentially full-time editing job uh, to be able to write consistently. Uh, the caveat, of course, is that I did not uh, have children. Uh, and so, you know, I was able to devote that kind of, of attention on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, but uh, turning to the sort of the business side of the writing, uh, you know, I, I think that this is where my age shows, is that uh, I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to be on Instagram. I don't want to be on Facebook talking about me. Uh, and, you know, I, I find, uh, you know, it, 
the whole sort of self-promotion uh, really just kind of felt uh, uncomfortable uh, for me. And so, you know, I think that this is a generational thing. And I don't know, because you know, when I look at other writers uh, who are doing that, I don't think, oh, you know, this, this person's full of shit and it's just what an ego. I don't, I don't think that, you know, but for me to do it, I think, oh, people are going to think I'm an asshole here if I'm, I'm promoting, self-promoting my book. And so, you know, I am just averse to, to doing that. But of course, that's what you actually need to do these days. Uh, you know, I mean, I know that what the world is where, you know, um, the, and the editor will get a manuscript and then they will actually go online to see what kind of social media presence that you have. Uh, and so, and a lot of times an editor will get interested in a writer uh, initially because of social media. And so that's a big deep part of it. And I, I, don't want, I don't want to get too far down this incredibly depressing rabbit hole, but, uh, <laughs> but do you think that that happens more with nonfiction books, uh, you know, like uh, that, that where an editor would, before even encountering the work itself, would maybe take an interest in, you know, because it's a non, you know, because the social media can be promoting the content, basically of, you know, like if the person is really into phishing, then they've got this. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Issue. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, they'll, they might read something or another and say, hey, why don't you to write an article? about this and so uh, you know some sort of anecdote uh, or whatever but you know it's like I, I look at uh, you know there are a lot of writers out there who uh, great writers and they have still made a career for themselves and and not become you know social media darlings and so yes. it's possible to do uh, but you know definitely uh, I think that um, it's helpful uh, especially for people who are trying to launch their careers to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, one person wants to know if you can talk a bit about the influence of music on your writing practice, uh, especially when you were working on Lonesome Lies before us. Uh, do yeah. You, yeah. I, just, I, I listen. Do you listen to music when you're writing? Well, do when I have to. Uh, to, to drown something out, I will listen to uh, lyricless, usually soundtracks, soundtracks to movies that I haven't even seen. I'll just, I'll, I'll just listen to soundtracks. Yeah. So, but that's it, only when I have to. That's interesting. Now, no, I mean, I listen to music uh, all the time when I'm, when I'm writing. Uh, music yeah. with lyrics. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, it was sort of like, you know, all country kind of stuff um, that I started listening to, I think, when I was writing uh, The Collective. And, uh, or maybe it was, it was earlier. Uh, maybe it was Rock and Roll. And so, but then, you know, that, that has kind of grown. And then, um, and then you know, Lonesome Lights Before Us is about a musician. And, um, you know, I started becoming interested in kind of indie uh, musicians. And, you know, talk about, like, self-promotion, uh, you know, what I started finding out was a lot of indie musicians uh, were doing a set of club dates, they were doing house tours, and they were putting these things together themselves, and, uh, and then staying with people who would host them for free and, and get a bunch of friends, 40 friends to come over and pay, like, 10 $15, and so I thought that that was really fascinating, and I got into it, you know, uh, more and more, but... Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I play bad guitar. I don't sing, uh, but, you know, I've, I've, uh, uh, I've listened to a, a ton of music and uh, different types of music. And, uh, and then one of my favorite musicians was, uh, is uh, Will Johnson, um, who was the head of a band called Central Manic. And, um, and I ended up approaching him, you know, cold email and asking if, he would help me write some lyrics for Lonesome Lights Before Us. And, uh, and it took a while, but eventually he, he replied. And so he, he helped me with the lyrics on three of the songs in there. 
and uh, we became friends. And, oh, that's and then, great. And then, uh, you know, she very shyly said, oh, you know, um, I've been working on some fiction. <laughs> and so, you know, I thought, hmm, I, uh, I hope this is good. It's kind of like your approach to endings. Don't fuck this up, you know. It's like, <laughs> I'm thinking with uh, somebody who's become a friend. Oh, you know, I, I hope this is good. And, uh, and it ended up that he sent me a few stories, and and uh, and they were great. And one of them, um, in secret, I I submitted to American Short Fiction, and then they and I didn't tell them, and then they <laughs> took it. <laughs> They took it. And right. so, so I called them up and I said, uh, you know, don't get pissed off at me, but uh, I submitted one of your stories uh, to a magazine and, um, and they want to publish it. And so, you know, is that okay? And, so, and he said, you fucker. But then he said, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it happened. It, it, it and then, happened. you know, he, he ended up, yeah, it happened. Uh, and then he ended up publishing it as was, it was part of an, of an all. Um, and uh, he ended up uh, publishing it up a small press in, in uh, Texas. Wow, that's great. That's a great story. Yeah. Wonderful story. Um, Mark Ranches says he just wants to say that you saying writing without looking back and living with your bad writing until you finish the first draft is such a powerful, liberating thing to hear. So thank you for that. And um, I have one quick question for you, and then we'll take one last question. Uh, and I think that's probably going to be all we have time for. This is kind of obscure and out of the blue, but it relates to this this last question. Um, is a piece of writing that you have worked on and you weren't able to finish uh, something that is still alive to you in general, or is it something that you are not going to look back at and and even more importantly than that, is a piece of writing that you've written, done your best to polish and submit, I mean, uh, 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 revise, and then submitted it and never found a home for it. Is that, here's, my, here's the question though. Yeah. Very shortly, here's the question, very briefly. Is that a dead thing to you or is that a living thing that you learn from that you know you're glad it's there because you spent your time with it or or it, it, yeah. is it something that is frustrating uh i think it's got to be more that it's frustrating and that, that it's dead but uh you know first with the uh, mark's uh, comment about uh living with bad writing um yeah i mean i i, I think that that's probably you know i figured out what I was doing as a writer when I finally uh, stopped being such a pretentious fuck. <laughs> That's it. You know, because I used to be... Like, how, how would you know? How would you know if you're, if you're a pretentious fuck? About, how do you know you're not? The, you know, the precious about the writing... What do you need an outside person to tell you? Hey, you've stopped being... <laughs> no, nobody told me, but I figured it out myself. You know, because it's like I would think, okay, I'm gonna do some writing, but I need to clear out four hours. And then I'm gonna need like a special, I gotta be in the mood. And you know, I've gotta have my like special pens and, and everything and pads and all of that. Uh, and then I realized, you know, I need to uh, make this less precious and you know, just be able to, uh, you know, write whenever I have the time and uh, and so I started uh, writing uh, with the TV on on the couch, uh, and uh, and that really changed everything because I all of a sudden I loosened up, and uh, and I found discovered I had a sense of humor. You know, I was so serious about everything. Uh, I have both, both, both the process and, and and the stories themselves. Yeah, I, I had mostly sports on. Uh, and so, you know, that would be playing there. I'd be on the couch. Uh, but also, I kind of learned to, like, you know, especially if people are out there and they're working or they have, you know, kids. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a, essentially what Ray Carver did when he was 
he had jobs and, and he had kids. And so he would write like a snatch, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. He's at the laundromat and he would write something. And so that's what I started doing too, is that uh, I had to, you know, go meet a friend, but I, I all of a sudden I got an idea and I wrote down, you know, the first page and a half of a story. And so you when take, you did that, you were working by hand when you do that, or are you yeah. bringing a little device with you? I didn't have devices at that time. So, uh, so you were just pulling out notebooks and jotting yeah. things down. Yeah, I mean, you know, these days you might use like the Notes app or something on uh, an iPhone, you know. But as far as what you were talking about, about things that uh, you work on and then discard, um, I ended up doing that for in my last two novels that I worked a year on uh, an entirely different storyline and uh, and did like spent an enormous amount of research. You know, this is like actively working on it even though I didn't accumulate a lot of pages. And then mm -hmm. at the end of that year, I decided I don't want to write this book. It was interesting because it wasn't, oh, you know, uh, I, I knew that the book could work and uh, and that you know somebody might find it interesting, but I didn't want to write it, and so I ended up. You know, this happened to me twice, and I ended up discarding it. And I thought, oh my god, I wasted so much time and effort here. But then I, I sort of had to accept maybe this is my process now, especially after it's happened twice. Is that yeah. I can't write the eventual novel unless I spend that year working on something else. And then I sort of figure out, oh, this is actually what I want to write. This is actually what I want to work on. I kind of find that at every level, and it's not a great thing, but like I, I, I often find that I need to write a sentence wrong a couple of times bef before I write it correctly, or I need to write a scene completely in some bullshit, ridiculous way, and then I can write it so that I almost end up with page count probably at least twice as many pages as I end up yeah yeah moving on to. yeah um you so know, okay so, so, let's so just, are, you know I mean I, I I think first it's okay if your first drafts are shit uh but also <laughs> it's okay if you have to to uh say all right you know this is not the direction that I and uh really want to go into but it will help you find the actual book or story that you want to write. Yeah. And I, I maintain that, it, that every time I sit down and do it, I'm learning how to do it. And right. so if that's true, then every time I write something that doesn't pan out, I've learned yeah. something. I mean, nothing, nothing is ever a waste for that. Uh, yeah. You're essentially, you're training, you know, you're, you're sort of flexing. And so it, that's never practicing. And so that's never a waste. And it's better than not writing anything is the other thing that I, I, I always feel. Is it's, I would rather have spent, say, a year working on something that didn't pan out and never look at it again than not write for a year because I couldn't, mm -hmm. couldn't come up with what to write. So last question, because um, we're going to run out of time here. Someone has asked about research. And so it, it's kind of a big, obviously a big topic, but some of your books have involved a lot of research and some I would assume didn't involve quite as much research and uh, so the question is do you how do you balance that out do you is it the research that leads to the idea for the for the novel or the other way around and if it's the other way around which I suspect it might be do you start the writing and then research, research along the way or do you need to submerge for a while in subject matter before you actually get to your own prose. Well, you know, I mean, I, I, at the start of this, I said, yeah, you know, I'm not a very good descriptive writer. And, uh, and then I will also admit, admit um, that I put too much research of my research in my story and, and my novel. That, uh, you think too much ends up in the final product? Yeah, too much of it. I mean, I, should, I need to cut more of that stuff out. Um, I put too much detail in, uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a weakness of, of mine, I know. Um, but, you know, for me, like, uh, it's interesting when you travel elsewhere and, you know, if you ask somebody you meet, oh, you know, what do you do? 
and uh, and then oftentimes the response is, "You Americans, why do you always ask? What do you do? Why, why does this matter to you?" <laughs> and so, uh, but for me, like you know, a person's job um, is fascinating to me. Uh, that it might be a boring job. But nonetheless, you know, it's something that this person spends a third of their life on a career. Um, or yeah. maybe it's not a career. Maybe it's just a sideline, a byway, or whatever. Uh, but, uh, but people's jobs, you know, you know I'll, I'll get an idea for a story or a novel, and then I'll think of a character's mm -hmm. occupation. And then that's when I'll start doing research. And that will usually uh, start uh, giving me ideas for character, for the person's mm. character. And so, and that will start to grow. And so, but it's also just an excuse to, you're not writing, but you're working. <laughs> you're actively working. Because you're, because you're researching. You can tell yourself, I'm, I'm working here on, on this book. Uh, I'm putting my time in. I'm at the desk, uh, and ultimately, like you know, that's what this business is: is yeah. you sit down, uh, and you know, uh, uh, Chuck Close, the painter, he said, yeah. "Inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us get to just get down to work." And uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's what it is: just sitting down, and uh, and you start working, and uh, and ultimately. You know, uh, we have to say that um, that's where the rewards and the pleasure is of just doing the work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you both. This was such a wonderful conversation. And Don, great to get a look into your occupation, your job. I love to hear writers getting into the weeds in terms of craft. And it's exactly what I think we we're looking for with this conference. So thanks for doing this with us. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of The Partition from Community Bookstore. Um, we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again for joining us and have a great evening. All right. Thank you so much, Noah. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, one story. Thank you. Take care.